onto the cloud. So, um, okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this um, session, which is um, the third one uh, this year for the this uh, academic term for in the uh, uh, the CWC uh, seminar lunchtime seminar series. Um, uh, of course, we deal with uh, Christianity uh, in the world. So it's a, um, a very um, a fitting um, location uh, that we actually find ourselves in the uh, eastern parts of, um, uh, of uh, Eurasia right now, because we have been in Africa, we have been in, the, in Central Asia, we have been in South Africa by default, yes. And then also um, we um, uh, have uh, other lectures lined up which will take us to China, but this one is actually a very special um, occasion where we will find out more about the East Siberian uh, and uh, Chinese, uh, North Chinese uh, connection. Um, the speaker is more illustrious than he thinks. Uh, he's very modest, but uh, Alexander Trenko um, has um, actually a history which uh, takes us, uh, which a personal history which takes himself uh, from Latvia, his uh, native Latvia, to um, uh, China and in the end uh, to the University of Hong Kong, where he um, uh, uh, accomplished his PhD. Um, City University of Hong Kong, um, and that's only um, I think three days, uh, three years ago. No, it's um, is four it three, years. yeah, four years, four years. Time flies, but before COVID, in any case, the second year before took COVID. Yes, um, and it's um, uh, his research interests are very much focused on the um, on Christianity in China and uh, of the, the Russian Orthodox Church, um, but then also on uh, Bible translations and of course. Um, uh, we know th from uh, uh, the Manchu context that there is a, a special, <laughs> yes, there's a link to Bible translations, um, um, but um, uh, the, the, important, uh, the importance is, of course, rests on the, um, uh, the uh, permanent uh, uh, Russian Orthodox mission in uh, Beijing, so in China. Um, uh, at the moment, he's he has worked as a uh, as a postdoc in at Heidelberg University, and I understand that this is also your position now. Um, the in academic in research uh, in terms of academic research, there's also a link with the university in Boston, which um, uh, some of us also share. Uh, but um, we um, uh, will be. Um, uh, cooperating on a number of levels um, uh, with uh, uh, Boston and with um, uh, institutions where Alexander will be at home, uh, I'm sure, um, because uh, this is, of course, a, um, a link which is there for life, because we are all working on the same uh, 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 material, uh, research material and regions. Um, Right, so uh, I don't want to say much more because um, much more intelligent things you will be able to hear from our speaker, Alexander Dimitrenko, uh, who will be uh, talking about um, New Testament translation projects um, and um, as conducted by the Orthodox missions in China. So my word to um, the speaker, and you are free to share your uh, any kind of presentation uh, from your end as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, one short remark from myself. Um, um, I was a postdoc uh, at Heidelberg University, but the project was for three years, so now it's over. And uh, now I have only affiliation to the Boston University as the um, visiting researcher. Uh, so now I will share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? I can see something white. Okay, so it's not that what we need. Uh, just a moment. Screen. Share screen. Okay, now you can see my presentation, right? Yes, yes, yes. Great.
So first of all, I would like I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Dr. Romina Estrati and to Dr. Lars Laman for inviting me to, to give this talk. And at the very beginning, I must say like a few words about the history of the Russian Ecclesiastical Commission in China. So as you can see, uh, it existed from 1715 till 1954. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there is there is a history even uh, beyond 1715 uh, because um, originally it came from uh, this um, Russian Cossacks uh, who will, were captured uh, by the Tsim army and uh, were brought to Peking in 1685. And uh, for that reason, the missionaries themselves uh, regarded that uh, the very beginning of the mission is in 1685. And besides those uh, Cossacks who were originally defending the Russian fortress on the Amur River, um, among them there was a, a Russian priest whose, whose name was Maxim Leontiev. Uh, nonetheless, some of historians indicate that there are uh, data uh, which indicate that uh, Maxim Leontiev's uh, actual surname was Tolstoy Uhov and uh, Leon Leonti was his father's name. So uh, through his his father's name, he became, uh, so to say, famous as uh, Maxim Leontiev. Uh, Nevertheless, so in any case, he was uh, the first uh, Russian Orthodox priest in Peking. Uh, uh, so around 1711, 1712, he passed away. And hence, there was agreement uh, between the uh, Tsing China and Russian Empire that uh, the first Russian ecclesiastical mission would come to China and uh, they came to China in 1715 to Peking. Um, and originally their uh, purpose was uh, to respond to the religious needs of this small group of Russian Cossacks who were later named Albazinians due to, uh, to this name of the fortress. Uh, the name of it was Albazin, so they were called Albazinians. Uh, so in 1715, the first Russian Ecclesiastical Commission came to China, and altogether there were 20. Uh, so as you can see, the history of uh, this Orthodox mission in China spans for more than 200 years. And it was officially abandoned in 1954. Uh, nonetheless, uh, till 1956, uh, there were some um, formalities uh, to be done, and uh, the last head of the mission uh, was still in China till 1956. So he uh, departed, departed to uh, the Soviet Union in 1956. Uh, so that's just the reason why sometimes you can see different years or different dates for uh, the Russian Ecclesiastic Commission in China. So the very first translator of the Chinese, uh, Orthodox translator of the Chinese New Testament was Guri Karpov. Archimandrit Guri Karpov is famous as the head of the 14th mission uh, in Peking uh, and the first Orthodox Chinese New Testament translator. Um, he was born in a family of priests, and uh, his secular name was Grigori, so Gregory. In 1836, he graduated the Sarov Theological Seminary, and the next year he entered the St. Petersburg uh, Theological Academy. Since 1838, he was a monk, and um, what's interesting about him, he was... Uh, a member of two missions. So the very first mission for him was the 12th mission, 
which was from 1840 till 1849. And already during that time, he started some uh, translation work, uh, some parts of the Bible, um, some um, uh, catechisms, um, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, during the 14th mission, where he was the head of this mission, he actually completed this um, first uh, Chinese New Testament translation. It was initiated in 1859, and this was done after uh, he received an instruction from the Holy Synod stating that after the Treaty of Tianjin had been signed, missionaries were allowed to preach not only Orthodox faith, but Christianity in general among Chinese people. Uh, so as you might know, uh, the Treaty of Tianjin was not only signed between Russia and uh, China, but also um, uh, by other countries, England, France, and also the United States. And uh, what is important to say, uh, although he received this instruction from the Holy Synod, it was his own individual project to, to do this translation. And the whole work of translation took six years altogether. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, a photocopy of the original translation from 1864. Um, the textual basis for, for this translation was the New Testament in Slavonic, meaning Church Slavonic, and Russian languages published with the blessing of the Holy Synod by the Bible Society in 1822. He also consulted the Greek and Latin New Testament edition uh, by a German biblical scholar, Konstantin von Tischendorf. Nonetheless, he uh, was consulting it only in the case if there were some unclear parts, some difficult parts to translate. Uh, what is interesting about this Tischendorf's edition that it was chosen due to its similarity to the Russian edition and uh, other missionaries have also indicated that they use, uh, for the same reason they used uh, this edition by Tischendorf to translate um, some parts from the Old Testament uh, and for liturgical books, for service books. Um, yeah, that's something which is important to say. Um, it is also important to say that he was not unaware of other uh, Chinese New Testament translations. Uh, in the report of the Holy Synod, uh, the following um, translations, Protestant translations are mentioned. The first one is Robert Morrison's New Testament translation, then the Old and New Testament translations completed by the Protestant Missionary Society, as it is stated, published in 1854, so obviously the Delegates version, and the Delegates version published by the American missionaries in 1859. Um, he have heard or, or he knew these translations from, um, um, from newspapers, but he could not obtain them until the October 1860. And once he has, could obtain them and could read them, he came to conclusions that uh, he must continue his translation, which he has started in 1859, uh, and he mentions some reasons for that. Um, um, first of all, he says, Protestant translators followed their own personal understanding of the text they translated. Uh, you might ask, so what's was the problem in that. So for Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Christians or Orthodox missionaries rely on the interpretation of, um, yeah, of the understanding uh, by church fathers or holy fathers. Uh, 
so that's one reason for him. And the second reason, he says, they, so Protestants, rejected the Christian terminology introduced by the Jesuits, which is used in China for more than 200 years and is easily understood by the local people, changing it to in the new terminology, which is not any better than the former one. Um, so I have mixed up this slide. So um, I wanted to say that um, about his um, criticism from uh, Archimandrit Avakum Chisnoi, who was a referee uh, of his translation, for his translation. Um, uh, Avakum Chisnoi, who was also um, a member of the uh, Russian Orthodox Mission in China, um, stated that this translation was the closest to the translation done by the English missionary Walter Henry Methurst from 1836. Uh, and he also states that Guri Karpov had detected and fixed parts of parts that were incorrectly translated by the English translator, while the correctly translated parts Archimandrit Guri has included into his own translation without any changes. If that's really the case, uh, I would say a whole study could be done on, on that, comparing two texts uh, and identifying which parts um, could be similar uh, or which parts uh, were included without any changes, which is again uh, uh, kind of striking because that contradicts with uh, the statement done by Guri Karpo, who uh, talks about his translation as an autonomous translation, which we will see later. Um, so there was uh, criticism and reception and criticism of this translation. According to Adaraski, who was, um, Nikolai Adaraski was another mission member and historian uh, and scholar who wrote several articles on the history of the Russian ecclesiastical mission in China. Uh, he states that Karpov had rendered the text of the gospel not close to the original and the language he used was too complicated. That is why his translation was criticized by his referee, Archimandrit Avakum. Nonetheless, Archimandrit Avakum Chasnoi, in his review, states that the rendering of the New Testament from Russian into Chinese must be justly acknowledged as the best of all contemporary translations. On the basis of remarks made by Chasnoi, the translation was revised and published in 1865. So it was the second edition. Uh, Guri Karpov has responded to this criticism and has described the translation process. He stated, the Chinese were witnesses of the fact that for a revision of my translation, I have invited a whole committee of scholars and was doing this revision for two years no one would believe that Father Avakum would have a better knowledge of Chinese than a Chinese person with an academic background. And he describes the translation process as following. I have never called upon anyone for help except God my Lord. Only a master of literature, the Chinese Lun, has helped me as a scribe. Usually I was walking around the room with the New Testament in my hands and dictated while Lum was sitting at the table and wrote down my translation. When the translation was done, which took four years, I have invited for the meeting a teacher Ivan from the school for boys and the teacher Maria from the school for girls Maria's son Nikita, and an Albazinian Moses. So Albazinian, the descendant of those uh, Russian Cossacks. 
All six of us were spending two hours a day for revision of the translation. Two three verses being read, and then all guests recount how they have understood what had been read. If I heard not the same idea that is in the original text, then we would seek for a reason for that difference. We have spent two years in doing such a revision, and I believe with the help of God, we have done the best we could. A uh, few words uh, regarding this personality of the Chinese assistant Lun Yuan. Um, I must say that Russian sources provide not as much information about this person. Um, in the report of the Holy Synod, he is indicated as a well-educated Chinese who was not at all familiar with Christianity. Um, uh, from the Chinese Herald, which was official periodical by the Russian Ecclesiastical Commission in China, um, it is known that uh, he was a teacher of the Archimandrit Palazi Kafarov, who was another famous missionary. And uh, both in Chinese Herald and in the preface to this translation, it is stated that uh, Lun Yuan was a Zhu Ren, which means he had this uh, degree uh, in the, uh, and uh, he was uh, a successful candidate in the imperial provincial examination. Um, uh, from uh, this uh, preface to the New Testament translation, we know that Lun was from the district of Sun Tien, uh, and as explained by Baker, another scholar, the term Suntian here indicates the Sianso, the place located in the region of Beijing where Lun Yuan, where Lun Yuan obtained his Duran degree. Um, uh, Paladi Kafarov, another missionary, uh, uh, indicated that um, Lunyan was his teacher, and he, so Kafarov, entrusted his teacher Lunyan to bring up to bring Mitrofan up, who subsequently became a priest and martyr, with special care to prepare him for late, him later for receiving ordination as a priest. Uh, the reason, uh, or uh, I mean, the fact that. Uh, Lunyan was entrusted to bring up uh, this person who later became a priest, um, indicates uh, that uh, he was very much respected by other uh, Russian Orthodox missionaries. Um, there is a testimony of Lunyan himself, also in the preface to this uh, New Testament translation. He stated, in the summer of the Renshu year, so 1862, he, Karpov, employed me to translate religious books, and I began to have the honor of his acquaintance of him. He then took out the New Testament to be revised and corrected. Thus, we studied from dawn to dusk, laboring tirelessly, not caring for ornate expressions, hoping only to make the meaning detailed and concise, and the other of the language to be correct with no difference from the original text. This is translation by Timothy Baker from his article. Um, hence from the testimony of uh, Lun Yuan, uh, he only became acquainted with Guri Karpov in 1862. Um, another um, missionary, Archimandrit Flavian Gorodeski, has mentioned uh, that um, uh, Lun Yuan has served in the mission for around 30 years. And uh, I assume he passed away around in the early 80s, so in 18. 
1880 or 1882. Uh, in this case, around 30 years would, would mean that he was um, there in the mission since 1850s, which means that exactly by that time, uh, Guri Karpov was not yet all, or already not in the mission. So it was between these two missions, the 12th and 14th. Um, so it might be true that um, uh, they got to know each other only in 1862. On the other hand, it contradicts a bit with this um, testimony by Guri Karpov, because he has st stated that uh, Lunian has helped him as a scribe. It's not real. It's, it's not really clear whether or not it was from the very beginning, or uh, probably only since 1862. Um, uh, what's Interesting also another testimony from Archimandrit Flavian Gorodetsky. He indicated that Lun was teaching him Chinese and was a pagan, but as a teacher had a profound knowledge and expertise and for many years served by the mission. If he was, if he was never baptized, it is even more striking that this man had been compiled, had even compiled some uh, catechetical literature for Orthodox Christians. Um, so I would like to say a few words about more about criticism and usage of this text. Uh, the permission to use this translation uh, for missionary purposes was only received from the Holy Synod in 1866 when Guri Karpov uh, uh, was already not in China. He came back to Russia. And uh, Vinogradov, uh, Alexei Vinogradov, uh, another um, member of the mission and scholar, indicates that only educated Chinese could read and understand it. He also indicated that the Orthodox Chinese used Karpov's translation and uh, Senior as you true, so it's a uh, Peking Bible version uh, for the study of the Bible text. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, he, uh, Vinogradov also indicates that uh, Flavian Gradesky found many unclear and obscure parts in this text, in this translation, and decided to republish his four gospel translation together with his own comments. The comments were based, based partly on his own interpretation, but mostly on the comments of the Holy Fathers. This uh, annotated tradition or, of four gospels was published in 1884. And Gorodesky also indicates that you know, Palazzi Kafarov made substantial changes in the very text of the gospel translated by, by Archbishop Guri. Um, and here we come to the possible reason why um, another um, mission member, another translator, um, uh, Innocent Figurovsky, has decided to do his own translation. Uh, here, monk Isaya Polikin, uh, who was also a famous translator uh, in the Russian ecclesiastical mission. Uh, has stated that he has read uh, previous translations completed by a Russian Orthodox missionaries and came to conclusion that most of the Chinese Orthodox theological terminology came from the Chinese Roman Catholic works. And consequently, it needed to be changed in order to suit the traditions of the Orthodox Church. So, the Bishop Innocent Figurovsky was um, uh, another translator. Um, he was born Ivan Apolonovich Figurovsky in 1863 
in a Panovo village in Siberia to the family of a priest. In 1878, uh, he entered the Tomsk Theological Seminary, and in 1884, he was ordained as a priest. Nonetheless, uh, unfortunately, uh, both his son and wife passed away uh, in 1885, and as a young priest, he decided to leave the village where uh, he was serving at the time, and he went to St. Petersburg. So for six years, uh, he was studying at um, St. Petersburg Theological Seminary and Academy. In 1890, he became a monk. In 1894, he became an archimandrite and was appointed to be a rector of St. Petersburg Theological Seminary. And in 1896, he was appointed to be the head of the 18th mission. Uh, here I would like to say a few words regarding his attitude towards missionary activities. He believed that the language used for preaching must be simple and clear to everyone rather than literally and abuse. Uh, this also can be regarded as his uh, translation principle. He stated that a permanent translation committee must be created for the translation of literature, and he was convinced that the head of mission must learn both Chinese and English. Uh, English was important in China at the time, as he has indicated, which he himself had done on a regular basis from the very beginning of his time in China. Again, we do not know much regarding the, process, um, the translation process. According to the report of 1908, that the Gospel of John was finished by the translation committee and published that year the new translations of the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles uh, up to the second Corinthians were published as well. In the published version of the New Testament from 1910, only Bishop Innocent was indicated as a translator. Uh, nonetheless, there was this uh, translation committee, uh, but it's uh, hard to tell to watch it to what extent it was involved. And I will say a few words later on that. And according to re the report of 1906, the Gospel of Matthew had been translated into literary Chinese in you in accordance with the Greek text. The cover also says that it, uh, it, it was translated from the Greek original. Uh, the, the history of Chinese Bible translation is hardly mentioned on the pages of uh, Kitaiski Bulgavisnik, so the Chinese Herald, the official periodical of the Russian Ecclesiastical Mission in China. Uh, one art article on missionary activities state that elder members of the mission were the closest assistants to Figurovsky and they performed different tasks including translation and book publishing. Uh, and what we also know that in 1910, the translation committee initiated the translation of Bible commentaries and some annotated editions of the gospels and Genesis were published in 1911. Uh, so uh, both uh, articles uh, completed by the mission members on the history of uh, the mission, uh, as well as uh, official periodical, do not provide much information on um, this uh, translation process. So what uh, I must say that uh, uh, the study must be uh, continued and we need to get more information if it is possible to get more information about this um, uh, translation, how, how it was translated, uh, what were uh, translation principles, what kind of materials were used 
uh, for this transition and who exactly was uh, the member, uh, who, who exactly were members of this transition committee. Um, interestingly enough, um, missionaries were in a search for a new language. The report of 1913 says the missionaries had discovered a method of translation into a language which is understandable by people and at the same time not shocking to intelligent people. The following is already translated into this language, part of the liturgy, some chapters of the gospel and epistles of the apostles. Uh, and What's interesting, what, what is interesting, the committee, this translation committee was um, working quite fast because already by December 14, 1913, the gospel and epistles were read in the new translation in a commonly understood language, which means they have done already another translation of at least gospels and epistles uh, by December 1913, uh, after this uh, 1910s translation was completed. Um, a few words about the influence of previous translations. Um, uh, I can say that there is a similarity in structure and vocabulary, especially in the choice of proper names between this and Carpus translation, translation, although not always. If we're talking about proper names, some proper names are uh, different from Carpus translation. Um, and this also follows from the testimony in Kitaiski um, Blagavisnik, so uh, the Chinese Herald, which says that the works of the previous members of the mission have served as the basis for new work. Uh, finally, um, the reason uh, for um, the reason why uh, the information is so reluctantly shared uh, in the official periodical might be the humbleness of its leader, uh, Innocent Fedorovsky. Um, uh, in, uh, in one interview, he stated in our missionary work, the gospel on the translation of which into Chinese Metropolitan Flavian of Kiev, so Metropolitan Flavian Gradesky has worked a lot, is of great use to the mission. The gospel is written in a popular, in popular Chinese language with commentaries. So here in 1913, when he has already published, um, so to say his own translation, in 1910, he's talking about the translation completed by Flavian Goradesky in 1884, which is uh, <laughs> quite striking. And finally, uh, just a few words regarding the future of this um, New Testament translation. This year, just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, this translation was republished um, by the Russian State University for the Humanities. And um, the committee uh, or uh, editorials hope uh, that uh, this translation will be used uh, for the church service uh, uh, by Orthodox Christians since it is the last uh, New Testament translation, Chinese New Testament translation, which was blessed by the Orthodox Bishop to be used during the service. And they are convinced that uh, we, have, we have a tradition, we have a certain tradition. It is still developing. Of course, uh, there is more than 100 years apart, but still, um, in, uh, in Chinese language, there, there is this classical language, which is uh, used for, um, for, for different um, 
in different religious denominations. For instance, in Buddhism, they're using classical language, although it's not, uh, although it is not uh, uh, Hua, which is used uh, nowadays, but it's not a problem for uh, religious service. Uh, and they also have uh, discovered that modern Chinese actually understand uh, this New Testament translation quite well. Although, uh, yeah, because um, nowadays um, all Chinese learn uh, Wenyan, so classical language uh, in their schools. So it's quite understandable. And it was the product uh, of uh, all these, um, so to say hundreds of years, uh, or not hundreds of years, but tens of years. Uh, so it was the product of this work of different translators. And we are coming from, we have a certain tradition, so we should use uh, this uh, New Testament translation uh, during the service, uh, despite the fact that, well, they, they hope that it will be used and they hope that, that it will be developed uh, and uh, there, will, there, will, there will be a future uh, for this translation. And um, yeah, I also hope that uh, it will be used for, to create something new. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. This was very, um, uh, I mean, interesting is not the word. It's, uh, I mean, th this provided details which um, my interest in the, the topic, um, uh, which certainly reached uh, those parts of my interest in the topic, uh, which I did not study, which I have not learned. Um, one, um, yes, but perhaps I just start off with a very simple question before opening it up to uh, the, the general public. And there, there are two places of publication. One is the Dong Zheng Jiao Zhong Hui. That's the, the Eastern, um, so, so the Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox um, 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 congregation, uh, church. A press, and um, they, I, I just wonder what they were publishing because um, the, the 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 location where in Beijing they were uh, established was almost identical was identical with that of the uh, uh, Russian state. Does that also function as a state press? Is there, do we have um, a, um, a is there a distinction between um, uh, spiritual material and maybe political material? Diplomatic material, maybe uh, translations uh, that are being uh, produced for the uh, for the Russian state, um, and then uh, slightly further back in time, uh, we're in the Beitang, Beitang Tuzhu Wan. That's uh, they, of course, they have um, they have their own muban, the the woodblock press. Um, I, I just wondered to what extent that was that was used. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, what I know that uh, they were publishing. Uh, First of all, yeah, um, of course, catechetical literature, and they were publishing um, uh, works done by uh, Russian Orthodox missionaries in China. So for instance, works on um, Buddhism, some translations. Uh, so it was not only religious literature, but to my knowledge, it was not used for um, uh, as a state uh, publishing house. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and to your uh, second question, can you repeat that? Well, it's the uh, the the, um, uh, the the woodblock press in in essence in the in the Beitung, which is the the Beitung, which is of course a um, uh, was set up by uh, by Jesuits. So it's the um, I, I just wonder whether they continued with that uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I remember, uh, yeah, Innocent Figurovsky has established his own publishing house. Okay. So it was in the mission. Right. 
So that was his private printing press, more or less, because, because the Russian church takes over that collection for some time, no? Yes. Yes. So that would have been the, um, in the and it travels. <laughs> it goes to Russian territory, I think, yes. Hmm? And then comes back. So it is a very, the Beitang collection is a very, has, has a very uh, agitated history. And um, th there is more to be discovered, yes. Uh, um yes I, I i yes i am not saying anything more to that uh, until we've taken more questions <laughs> yes we have another question um, i have several questions alexander um yes this yeah. was this was this was a great talk because if for no other reason that it confirmed my my grand ignorance of the the orthodox work in in china um, but I have some, maybe some basic questions for you that would help me begin to get a handle on some of that you were telling us. I would, I just out of curiosity, what was the name of God that the Orthodox were using in their translations, um, since that was such a contested issue among the other groups? And then second, can you also tell us just a little bit about how the Bible was expected to be used? Um, was this really just for reading in a worship service, or was there a hope that Chinese believers were taking this home and studying it at home as well. What, what was sort of the expected use of the, these translations? Well, first of all, yes, this uh, question about this, uh, the term question, of course. Uh, yes, there was a change, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so uh, as you could see, Guri Karpov has indicated that um, we should use this terminology created by the Jesuits. So he has used the term Tianzhu, so the heavenly father, uh, the, the heavenly uh, Lord uh, in his translation, uh, while Innocent Figurovsky has decided to change that to Shandi. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing the only reason for that, which I could discover in um, this um, Chinese Herald, you know, this periodical, was that uh, Tianzhu, well, first of all, of course, it is associated with the uh, Catholic Church, but secondly, it's a kind of um, Suze Belly you know, when there is. Uh, such words as Tianzhu water drool, Tianzhu water drool, or something, they found it like um, sometimes it, it comes together like too close. So they, they wanted to, to change it to uh, Shandi. I'm not sure if it was um, the only reason or was, or was it, uh, only something that Innocent Figurovsky has decided to do. But the fact is that in that translation from 1910, uh, they use Shandi for, for the God. Um, again, the second question, what was the second question? Yeah, no, fine. Um, my second question was, how, how did the, the people, ex uh, the translators expect oh, these right. Bibles to be used? Yes. Uh, so as I have mentioned, they, they were using it for a church service, but also for uh, to study the Bible. I do not know for sure if it was uh, like given to, to believers to read it at home. Uh, I, I do not have uh, this kind of information. Uh, but I assume that it was mostly used during the service or during this uh, study of the text. Um, probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had another question in chat. Uh, Lars, can you can you read that? One second. Uh, oh, it is actually not a question. It's a. It's. Um, uh, 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 Hraj, uh, uh -huh. saying that he can't stay. Well, th this is the 
this is this lunchtime hour, which is very, always very busy and uh, many people can't come, but they rely on the um, recording. That That is the, um, um, uh, th that's why it's important to focus on questions that we can actually pass on to the wider world. So it's, uh, I, I am um, wondering, uh, how, how is this connected to your actual research, your current research? What is it that you're working on? Uh, well, um, actually, this was part of my dissertation, mm -hmm. uh, what, what I have done before. And um, yeah, at the moment, um, as, as you might know, I'm uh, working uh, for, um, for this uh, mm -hmm. CHCD. Uh, so, uh, China Historical Christian Database. So I'm working on uh, data cleaning. So now it is not uh, as much directly related to to my risk, what I'm doing now, but it it is definitely related to uh, this database. Since I will provide information for on um, Russian Orthodox missionaries in China. Uh, for uh, the China Historical Christian Database. Richard, Eleonore, do you have any questions? You may not be able to answer because um, in places where you can't speak, you can't write. You can also write something into the chat. Can I ask another question then? Daryl, yeah. yeah, of course, yes. Uh, uh, in terms of that, what are you working on now question, Alexander? I know that you are planning a, a book chapter around um, sort of a, a vision of mission or, or the, this orthodox understanding of, of mission in China. Does some of what you talked about today intersect with that? And if so, how would that come together? Um, in that chapter, I would talk more about the involvement of uh, the Chinese um, uh, into this work. So it's not not only or not as much about uh, their involvement in the translation of um, New Testament, but their involvement both in translation activities. So most of that uh, what of what was done was the translation of uh, church service books uh, secondly um, chinese christians were involved in church service so they were singing they were also sometimes they were uh, preaching in a church uh, so my focus will be more on uh, Chinese Christians and their involvement uh, uh, in missionary activities. Yes, Lars, I don't hear you. Unmute. If, if you, oh, Richard, did you want to say anything? Well, no. Um, uh, yes. Well, yes. thought going okay. through my mind. I mean. Was maybe I haven't got this clear enough. Was a translation done of the Old Testament in in this history, and and then what was the basis of that translation? Was it the Septuagint or uh, for the old um, for the Old Testament? They only uh, well Russian missionaries have only translated parts of the Old Testament, which were read during the service. Yeah. Uh, so-called paramias uh, and um, yes as far as I know they uh, they use this uh, teaching doors um, edition for um, and yeah I can't say for sure um, I don't remember exactly uh, what was the textual basis for for such translation? But the, what what I can say for sure is that uh, they did not uh, translate the Old Testament completely. 
so it was only partly translated. And uh, there is there were like short histories, uh, translations of the short history of the Old Testament. Thank you. Thank you for your question. What about the Book of Kings? This comes up um, because one of my students, who can't be here at the moment, um, is, is working on, on a Manchu translation, and he found out that uh, that, that had a certain uh, appeal. He's trying to argue in his chapter. I mean, I can't talk for him, but uh, he, he's, uh, he's trying to argue in his chapter why this might have been important to the Chinese. Um, that that's interesting. It will, it will be interesting to know what 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 his discoveries are. You, you will find out. <laughs> it's the, yes, it's. Uh, but but anyway, so it's um uh, yeah that's the the other uh, missing dimension in a way. It's um uh, because you have uh, you you have to see that the Russians, of course, are very much interested in uh, in China as a. Um, a, a uh, an empire which is uh, tangential to their own empire, so it's uh, so you have also an interest in uh, minority languages. Ma Manchu is of course important because it's the second official language in the empire, uh, in the Chinese empire. But uh, th th you also get an initial uh, sort of an incipient interest in uh, minority languages like Evenk and so on. So this is I, I just wonder whether the um, uh, the uh, um, people who are Bible translators, whether they had any interest in Manchu, for example. Do you have any evidence for, for that, or uh, are they solely uh, concentrated on Chinese? Well, I, I think you, you have heard about this so Lipovsev's translation. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> yes. Manchu language. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's, um, so the, the, it is um, a, um, a challenge to find words. Yes, that's right. Yes, and be, because you have to, uh, um, I, that, that's what it reminded me of. Because because uh, in Manchu, of course, they have to they have to relate uh, to uh, Manchu culture or Chinese culture through Manchu eyes, and that's uh, that. What was it? The daily bread is the uh, is the nangi <laughs> dari mantou. It's the, ma the daily mantou, the uh, steamed bun. That's the uh, yes, and so um, and so it's um, you know you have a a. a uh, a, a constant source for inspiration which comes out of the daily life. Hmm? Yeah. Yes. Um, I had another question, but I actually spoke with uh, my microphone switched off and now I can't remember the question, but uh, hmm. uh, it's uh, um, it was not the Manchus, it was, uh, uh, um, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, what, what happens after 1917? Yeah, I, after 1917, of course, there were many developments. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, um, yeah, first of all, uh, many Russians came to China. Mm -hmm. So Russian migrants, Russian migration. And uh, Due to that reason, uh, missionaries, uh, Russian ecclesiastical mission has focused much on uh, uh, to help uh, those Russian immigrants. Uh, secondly, uh, I think for more than 20 years, uh, Russian ecclesiastical mission uh, became part of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad. If I'm not mistaken, it was from 1922 till 1945. Uh, and um, of course, they, yeah, they focus much on uh, Russian immigrants. Nonetheless, of course, there were, uh, there was also development in, um, in this uh, Chinese Orthodox Church, so there were uh, there were also um, uh, Chinese priests mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Chinese parishes, uh, and 
as far as I know, there were even uh, conflicts between uh, so some uh, Chinese Orthodox, uh, so to say, were not happy that uh, the mission is focusing as much on helping um, Russians, uh, Russian migrants, mm. and not, uh, not focusing as much on um, Chinese. And um, yeah, since 1945, uh, the Russian Ecclesiastical Commission became again part of the Russian Orthodox Church and not Russian Orthodox Church abroad. So we were, they were back to the Moscow Patriarchate. And uh, since those, since that time, they started talking about uh, that yeah, mission must be abandoned, and uh, the the new autonomous Chinese Orthodox Church must be created, must be established. And this was done by uh, 1960, uh, 1956. Um, so uh, two Chinese bishops were ordained. And um, yeah, in uh, 1956, the last head of the, of the last 20th mission in China, uh, Victor Svasin, um, um, yeah, came back to the Soviet Union and uh -huh. uh, the autonomous um, Chinese Orthodox Church um, continued to exist. Yes. To, yes. And it's, it exists till nowadays. It exists until today, yes or no? It's, yeah, yes. So here we have a question from Eleanor. Um, uh, she, I, let me read out. Many thanks for your talk, Alexander. I'm afraid my connection was dropping. Yes, I missed some. There's going to be a recording, yes. Are there any parts of the translations that are discussed as being difficult to translate into Chinese, either for linguistic or conceptual reasons? Anything particularly problematic, for example, the concept of the Holy Trinity? Well, if we're talking about concepts, uh, yeah, it was, the issues were the same that for, uh, the Catholic and Protestants, uh, such such terms as baptism, Holy Spirit, um, uh, by the way, the concept of Holy Trinity, well, that such term does not appear in the Bible. So it was not the case for, for the Bible, but uh, the Holy Spirit, of course, it was um, uh, a question. An, an issue. Um, if we're talking about uh, specific parts, uh, I do not know for sure um, which which parts precisely uh, Russian Orthodox uh, translators found difficult. Um, I remember that, for instance, uh, for uh, the Nicholas of Japan, who was translating New Testament into Japanese, uh, he was, um, yeah, he was talking about uh, difficulty to translate. Um, I think it was uh, Epistle of Saint Paul, uh, and uh, yeah, he he was talking, uh, telling us or writing his, in his di uh, diary uh, that I have so many different translation and commentaries in front of me and I still can't understand uh, whether or not this this word is related to the Holy Spirit or to the Jesus or to Jesus, to Jesus. Uh, and things, things like that. Um, so I assume uh, Russian Orthodox uh, translators uh, uh, in China, uh, had several issues, uh, similar issues. Richard, did you have a book that you wanted to show? Well, us? I had, I had my Orthodox Study Bible. Oh, okay. <laughs> but is it not in Matthew ends baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? 
So uh -huh. the Trinity is the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I don't think the, uh, the Holy Trinity is completely missing from the Bible. Well, I mean, the very term, the Holy Trinity, is oh, not. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, there are many places where, where we can uh, identify that uh, the God is the Holy Trinity. Yes, yes. Yes, definitely. But so, okay, I understand. So the actual term Trinity per se, it, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, what what you have quoted is is the famous yeah uh, verse. The great Commission in Matthew, yeah, yeah, from chapter twenty eight. Yes, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I wanted to again to show this yeah so. new re republishing of of uh, the translation by uh, Innocent Pogorovsky. Um, yeah, as far as I know, it was uh, only reprinted like a few weeks ago. So uh, where, where, where is it reprinted? It, it, it is in Moscow, uh -huh. uh, uh, the Russian State um, University for human the Humanities. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm. Yeah, and I'm uh, grateful to uh, to this uh, editorial committee for for sending me mm. we will look out for it it's uh, good to have uh, in um because as you say it's a con, con a, a religious tradition which continues uh, up to the present day and this is uh, it may not be big but it is uh, very significant and it's um um and it con contributes to the uh, you know the uh, multiplicity, the uh, pl plurality of um, of traditions that you have in China. So th this is very important. Um, I, I can, yes, okay, it sounds like it will be a good one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> You're not saying thank you. Um, now, um, I think, I think it might be, it might be coming to an end. Uh, so I would like to thank um, Dr. Alexander Dmitrenko for this uh, very interesting and thought-provoking um, lecture which um, uh, will certainly continue in terms of research and uh, uh, we will be in touch with each other and we will uh, also we also welcome at, at any other point in the seminar series references to this so you can um, uh, if you if there are questions that come up in the context of China there's at least going to be one other uh, one other seminar then um, uh, I, I will make sure that I copy you into the uh, list of guests then we'll see what um, uh, what you um, uh, what you have to co uh, to answer or to con contribute so but for the time being thank you very much and um, I wish you all a very nice continuation of the day bye 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 thank you bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.